I had all of these things that had shown me that the world is out to get you. People are not good and people will not help you. People will take advantage of you. A very negative sort of outlook to a point that whenever I did try to do something, I would either end up crippling it myself that it shouldn't work out so that I would be able to turn around and say it's not working or I would be my biggest hater. I would tell myself it wouldn't work and, and it wouldn't work. Welcome to Hope to Recharge podcast. Thank you for joining me here again today. Every week we meet here to break the stigma around mental health and to bring you insight and inspiration and lots of practical tips from personal stories or professionals around the world that share how they turn their journey of mental health into healing or to thriving. Together we will break the stigma one story at a time. And mental health together is always better. Thank you for joining me here today. I'm your host, Matana. Let's get started. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com, the leading online platform for therapy. You can access thousands of therapists one click away. Go check out BetterHelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Get 10% off your first month. Start your wellness now. In this episode of the Hope to Recharge podcast, we welcome Joe Brickman. As a former paratrooper in the Israeli Defense Forces, Joe shares with us his personal life and business strategies, which he also reveals in his recently published book, Fixing Broken. Facing adversity at a young age, having been abused by a babysitter and his father being diagnosed with cancer, Joe was sent off to boarding school where he was unable to live up to the school's strict expectations. Combined with flashbacks and issues he had been dealing with made him feel hopeless and attempted suicide on his 14th birthday. Having adopted a negative outlook on life and expecting things to go poorly, Joe eventually turned the corner through years of EMDR and other therapies to deal with his trauma and has learned ways of predicting and coping with episodes of depression. In this episode, we hear the details of the traumatic childhood that he experienced and is rising up to fixing what was broken, healing himself, and moving forward in life. And now your host for the Hope to Recharge podcast, Matana. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me here again today. Joe Brickman grew up in New York and Crown Heights. Then he decided to move to Israel and become a soldier in the IDF, which is huge to become a lone soldier without your family supporting you there. That's an extra level of strength to do that. And then he came back to America, wrote a book called Fixing Broken. Can you imagine what's in that book, Fixing Broken? And he was telling me a little bit about his life, 24 years old, a broker in South Florida, and conquering the world where he could have said, I have all the reasons in the world to stay the victim, to stay and say, I can't, to stay and say, the world has to feed me. I am broken, but very young. I don't know what part of life he said, no more to being a victim. I am going to choose to be my hero. And it's only me that can save me. I can heal myself. I can move forward. I can move the obstacles. If I wait for the world to do it for me, I'll stay in the same position. Joe, this is a fascinating story. We both grew up Orthodox, but in very different communities. So I want to hear a little bit about your background, your family, your schools, your education, and where your first big adversity met you in life. I grew up in Crown Heights in Brooklyn, New York. I'm the oldest of six kids. And I went to the traditional schools that you go to growing up in a Chabad Orthodox family in Crown Heights. I went to Olay Torah from pretty much the first time I stepped into a school through eighth grade. From there, I moved on to a yeshiva in Staten Island, New York. From there, I went to Toronto and then later on ended up leaving Yeshiva through finishing Yeshiva in Montreal. And then I booked a one-way flight to Miami when I was 18. The first adversity that I really faced in my life, when I was between the ages of 8 and 10, I was sexually abused by a babysitter who used to work for my family. A babysitter? And yeah. I thought you know, you're going to say a rabbi or a neighbor or an uncle. A babysitter. Yeah. A lot of people have this idea in their head that when they think sexual abuse, they automatically think a a male 
for some reason, just because of the way that the stereotype has been. But there's a very big percentage of people that go through sexual abuse that were actually abused the opposite, where it's the female who's the aggressor. And a lot of people don't talk about that because in today's society, it's very easy to flip the script, flip the story back onto anybody who may bring light onto something like that. But in my situation, it really took me a long time to even deal with all of that and learning how to come out and talk about that. But to me, one of the biggest comforts that I had was that I was eight. There's not really much that you can flip the script back on an eight-year-old. So yeah, that was really the first big thing that, that I had to deal with in my life. I didn't really know how to talk about that, deal with that, or, or anything like that. The first time it, it really came to light was when I was going through preparing the invitations for, for my bar mitzvah. Jewish boys, when we turn 13, we have a celebration. And going through the invite list, I, I saw this woman's name on the invite list. And the gist of the conversation with my parents was basically either it's going to be me there or it's going to be her there. And over the course of that night, I sat down with my father and I started talking to him about what I was dealing with. That was short-lived. My father was diagnosed with cancer a couple months afterwards. And it, things just got really interesting. I went away to school. I started really just experiencing flashbacks and different types of urges, trauma, just different things that your regular 13, 14, 15 year old kid isn't really dealing with. I tried to commit suicide on my 14th birthday. I mm -hmm. lived through that. And then I'm not going to spoil the whole book for all y'all. Uh, oh, I have so but, many uh, questions. Uh -huh. Wow. I'm sure. processing. One second. I'm processing. Okay. First of all, I have chills. As a mother, I have chills. And all I am thinking of what would I do if my child had a secret that he was holding for so many years and then sharing it with me right before a milestone for him or her? How would I process it as a parent, let alone what is this child going through? Holding a secret for so many years, five years, holding a secret, four years, whatever it was, like whatever, if it was eight and a half till 13, just to hold that secret. And what was it like to let that secret out. Before I'm going to ask you that, I want to understand, did you know when it was happening to you that it was wrong or was your eight-year-old mind saying, maybe this is okay because she's a babysitter? I actually had a very heated argument with somebody uh, a couple of years ago about this. Whereas can an eight-year-old boy have the mental capacity to understand what is going on? And the answer is obviously no. It is impossible to really understand what is happening in the moment, the way children think, which I explain in my book, how the brain processes emotions in order to really understand what the mind of an eight-year-old boy might look like. But essentially it's okay. I trust this person. I love this person. This person feeds me, takes care of me, does things for me, with me. Whatever they're doing is probably what grown-ups do. As a kid, don't you remember how you always wanted to be sitting at the grown-up's table? You always wanted to be part of the grown-up thing. As a child, you cannot actually process and understand what is going on in the moment. And honestly, even going through puberty and, and growing up, you also don't necessarily even understand what happened until you really start getting flashbacks and you really start fearing the people that are similar as your aggressor and, and you really start shutting down as a human being. Only then maybe do you realize, okay, something's wrong here. I have to fix it. And so say, you really didn't know. Yeah. It wasn't something that you could say, I'm not sure I could tell on her or discuss this because maybe this is normal and people might think I'm crazy or maybe people won't believe me. So I'll just live with the secret. Yeah, I, I don't know that I necessarily was able to have that sort of deep comprehension of what was going on at that point. But definitely as the years went on, a lot of those emotions were what was ultimately holding me back because there was the shame, there was the guilt, there was the not sure if this is actually something. You have to remember going maybe up until seven or eight years ago, sexual abuse wasn't something that the Jewish community openly spoke about. Even to date, there are still people who are in vehement denial about what has happened or what continues to happen in certain communities. Let's just say that the Chabad community was slowly getting its awakening as to what was going on. My Mother and father did whatever they were physically able to do from when I started talking to trying to get me in to help. They believed you right away. And then, yeah. It, as soon as I started talking, I was taken very seriously. And, and everything I said, they, they tried to help me out. There, there wasn't that much education, nor were there people to talk to then who you can pick up the phone and say, hey, listen, my son's talking about this who, what, where. There wasn't anything. 
In my case, it was a therapist who was a family friend who ended up feeding all of the information I was telling him back to other people, Mm -hmm. which if that to me, you know, was something that I really lost a lot of trust. Wow. In just the ability to heal ultimately. Mm. And I detail it a lot of my book about where I was holding and, and what I was going through. It's even though I've done a lot of therapy to delete all of the emotions that come with it. I've done EMDR therapy, a lot of it, but, but even though I've been through that, there are still certain things that you can never really delete. And there are certain emotions that going through some of these processes and talking about them, they're deep and you can't desensitize to them because of how impactful they were. People don't realize that kids, as much as they're kids, they're, they're mini humans. So everything that goes in ultimately is going to show itself somewhere. And when I found myself where I was at 18, I had all of these things that had shown me that, okay, listen, the world is out to get you. People are not good and people will not help you and people will take advantage of you. A very negative sort of outlook to a point that whenever I did try to do something, I would either end up crippling it myself that it shouldn't work out. So like that, I would be able to turn around and say, hey, look, it's not working. Or I would be my biggest hater. I would tell myself it wouldn't work and, and it wouldn't work. Right. Because ultimately, you, you believe whatever you believe is, is what exactly. you achieve. Learning that cycle and going through those different times ultimately, you know, is what led me at the age of 21 to go and enlist in the army after I had already set up a lot of my life over here. Because once I was able to go through and, and rework a lot of that composition and rework and, and live through a lot of experience, life, trauma, and things like that, it's ultimately where I, I felt that hey, if there's ever going to be a time, it'll be then. And then throughout that process, being able to watch another endeavor of mine take off and work out, I I was really pushed myself. And I felt, listen, if by societal standards, I should not be here and anything that I've done should not have actually worked out. For all the people who are like me, here is something that you can look at every single day and say, listen, if he can do it, I'm a lot more skilled than he is. I can definitely do it. And that's ultimately what I'm trying to you know, put out over here is no matter where you look, you can find encouragement or you can find somebody who, who will tell you, announce today's day on social media that you went on a vacation or you went and you hung out with whoever it may be. You have all these people who are cheering you on. You went and you spent all this money and whatever pe- people are cheering you on, but you go out and you post something about a new business you're doing, a new blog you're doing, a new initiative you have. Everyone's like, hey, nice, cute. Oh, that's cute. But you know, h- how many people are, are actually like as serious as you in your own circle and learning how to continue with that was ultimately... Us versus us. Yeah. Wow. So I want to go back to the 13-year-old, the 13-year-old that finally released the secret had the courage to release the secret by the time you were 13 you said okay it's me or her at this bar mitzvah it's Mm -hmm. like you knew by 13 that it was wrong what you did here's the reality of fifth grade sixth grade seventh grade as even then as like kids grow up they say that the strictest parents make the best liar because that's what it was in my house we didn't have internet we weren't allowed to have any sort of internet devices but obviously all my friends had ipods ipod touches different types of things and and it wasn't a matter of time until i was able to get my hands on one and all i would do was really just try and figure out okay what where what's my place in all of this you have that one kid who at wherever stage he is in his mature really process, figure something out, learn something, brings it to the class. The whole class is talking about it. That's just how, and at a certain point, like I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, what? And I'll, and this is 10, 11, 12. What's going on over here? What is this? How is this? And I, I would sit and I would literally try and figure out, okay, so where do I fit in? Mm-hmm. Like, where is what happened to me? Where does that fit? And it didn't. When you're that deep in as a kid, you don't really have anybody to talk to about something like that when you're completely on your own, especially then. So your parents never spoke to you and said, listen, did you ever go to sleepaway camp, by the way? Yeah. um, And they never spoke to you about it? Like this is, these are the conversations that you have before you go to sleepaway camp. Listen, you have to be careful. You don't hang out with one-on-one. If somebody touches you, it's not okay. I don't care who it is. It's not okay. You tell us no matter how much they threaten it, you tell us 
that you never had this conversation with your parents? These are the conversations that we have now. These are the conversations that parents have now. In today's day and age, parents now have these conversations. But if you want to bring it back 10, 15, and even before me, 20, 30 years ago, parents didn't have a conversation, at least most parents from people that I've spoken to who have went through things. It's not necessarily that they didn't have a conversation. The parents talking about whatever it is, to some people didn't check off by saying, oh, okay, and with a rabbi, it's not okay. And with a, a babysitter, it's not okay. And with a, if you're not sitting here thinking, yeah, obviously you're told things, like I, I don't even remember what that conversation looked like with my parents. I remember what the girlfriend conversation looked like with my parents, but I was already older by then. Like that, between that whole age gap from growing up, learning how to talk, going to school, it comes up, but remember, even for anybody listening to this podcast that's older than me, that's older than 25, you remember how awkward that conversation was with your parents because there was no standardized way of doing it. Every parent had to go dig deep into their gut and figure out, okay, what did my mom tell me and how do I not make this weird? Like that conversation is going to be weird. Even if you know that it's, it's going to be weird that the, even if you have awareness, it's going to be weird. It's just going to be a hard conversation. It depends how open you are with your children, but it's going to be a, a tough conversation, but it has to be had. 100%. And I'm not saying that I did not have that conversation. I'm just saying that regardless or not of whether that conversation was something that came up to me, thinking of the, like of it in context of a woman who one day was my best friend and then literally the next day became this. And it, it's not it just hit me head on. It was a, a progressive, like sitting, right. walking through the steps of there's a grooming process, it's called, and talking with therapists about how and what everything went through. Like it, it literally lined up to where, to a point to where I went back and I tried to even talk to other families who would use this person and nobody would talk to me. Wow. Um, that, I, that has nothing to say about anything, but for a long time, it, it bothered me that somebody who has free access to kids is able to do whatever she wants. But it really wasn't until 2015 that I really started talking about things like this and starting to share things like this. And I, I realized that there's a lot of people that are carrying secrets like this and are struggling with the aftermath of abuse. Some people it's in their family, it's intra-family. It's with some people it's rabbis and some people it's just people and everyone's struggling with something, but some people are struggling a little harder. And every time I've, you know, been able to come out and share and talk and really just relive some experiences, I always have those people who reach out to me and say, listen, thank you for doing that. I'm now seeing a therapist and I'm now working through my shit and I'm now trying wow. to figure out my life because ultimately it doesn't make a difference how old you are or how advanced you are in your life. As soon as you decide that, hey, today is a new day and I'm going to do what I want to do because that's what makes me happy and that's what helps me feel fulfilled then like you said you it's only you against you everything else just figures itself out what happened at 14 that you tried to attempt suicide i was in a yeshiva that i talk about this in in, in my book as well I, I was in a yeshiva where it was a very catered to a certain type of 14 year old, someone who was super studious and was very interested in learning and advancing their learning and, and learning and, and learning. And I did learn a lot. I mean, I did get really good grades, but the teachers there for some reason were just never satisfied with anything that I had to do. Could be it was just my perspective in, in life because by then the world was out to get me and I had to be careful. And it could be that my perception of certain things might have perverted the reality, but I do remember and I have been through things of like, where I'm trying to go and continue learning, maybe something outside the quota. And a rabbi would come over and say something like, hey, if you can't follow and be disciplined and listen to the structure over here, then you're not even going to be able to flip burgers at McDonald's. They said that? Yeah, exactly. Wow. To my faith. And this is me, somebody here who not only did I learn everything that they had given us to learn, but I learned more than that. And I completed the entire Talmud in a very short amount of time. Most people don't do that. And I completed that in a short amount of time. By the time I had walked out of school in Montreal to take my one-way flight to Miami, I had already completed everything. Wow. And these are people who are like, hey, listen, we don't care what you're doing, but if you're not doing it the way we want it, then it's not the right way. And this was a common theme that I found throughout all of my yeshiva years. 
where if I'm not doing something by a specific way, or if I don't fit into a certain mold, or if I'm not doing something and someone didn't see me or lots of different criteria, then, then it's not it. And at a certain point, my real question was, okay, if what I'm doing is not it, then what is it? Like, and if tell what, me. no, but what if you're, what you're telling me is it feels so wrong to me. Am I supposed to continue life with the it that it feels so off and be okay with it? Yeah, I, I, that's a great, I, I wasn't sure if you wanted to go. No, I'm saying like, no, because... really, because what if someone's saying, okay, this is the it. I love how you say that the it, this, mm -hmm. the it, I see the it here. You see the it here. The way I perceive the it is so wrong, but you perceive my it wrong. So which one do I choose myself? or you in order to accept me, but still I'm miserable inside. Today's episode is sponsored by EmotionallySensitive.com. Are you struggling with overwhelming intense emotions? Check out EmotionallySensitive.com's online DBT skills course today. Again, that's EmotionallySensitive.com. So which one do I choose, myself or you in order to accept me, but still I'm miserable inside? One of the best ways that has helped me begin my healing and even continue moving forward with things was learning how to give not labels, but learning how to give a concept to certain things. So not necessarily that I'm labeling certain feelings, feeling a certain way, but I know that if I do something specific or if I go through something specific, it will trigger me to feel a certain way. So now I know that this is something that if I go through this motion, I need to be prepared because ultimately I will end up feeling a certain way living with depression, that even though there are certain things that you may have that are considered big accomplishments, but sometimes in the car after this big accomplishment, you don't necessarily feel like you're, you're fulfilled and you don't feel right. the happiness that a regular right. person would feel. Instead of allowing myself to, to go through that path of now sitting seven days and not doing anything because uh, I'm upset, I turn around and say, okay, listen, before I head out to go do this major accomplishment, I know that in six hours from now, here's how I'm going to be feeling. You prepare yourself for the feeling. So what do I do? I go and I call three people who I know that no matter what, these people are not going to answer. This is a real tip right now. These are like, I go Love and I call this. three people who I know that no matter what, these people are not going to answer my phone call right now whether they're at work, whether it's too early in the morning, I love that. whether it's, I love that. and then when they call me back, I don't answer the phone until I'm done with what I'm doing. And until I'm feeling the way I'm feeling, it's brilliant. You leave them a message and say, Hey, I'm going in a closing. I'm afraid I'm going to feel crap in four hours. So I haven't gotten that far yet because the people that still return my calls, I don't want people to walk on eggshells or be like, not sure about, okay, what is going okay. on? Yeah. Usually it's a voicemail and I leave them a voice and I go, Hey, it's Joe Brickman. I wanted to call. I hope you're having an amazing day. I haven't spoken to you in a minute. Give me a call back when you're available. I'll talk to you soon. And then usually after a voicemail like that, people try and call me back 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but I just, I don't pick up the call. And then on my way back, normally when I'd be feeling this way, I normally have two or three missed calls. So that's when I return my phone call. That is brilliant. You know the saying, you are preparing the healing before you get wounded, but you're preparing yourself to say, catch me where I know I'm going to fall. So you're preparing the mesh that is going to hold you when you're going to fall. Yeah, I, I, I was a paratrooper, so I like to think about it from a little bit of a different mm. standpoint. Instead mm -hmm. of saying, hey, catch me when I fall, it goes, let me put on a parachute like that. When I do fall, oh. I can take it slowly Fabulous. and I'm not crashing into anywhere. Fabulous. But Fabulous. I have a second to actually assess where I'm going and, and do everything methodically. U ultimately, everything in life boils down to two things, a system and a process. And they both go hand in hand. This is something that for me took time to become part of my process, but now it's automatic. It was okay. I'm going into, to get a deal done. I'm going into an appointment. I'm going to meet with somebody. And then I realized, okay, well, now I need to have people to call. But if I'm going to have people to call, it means I have to meet people, which then that in and of itself also tied into the anxiety of, okay, now I'm going to have to go out. I'm going to have to meet people. I'm on my own. And the ultimate idea here is that, okay, there's a problem. All right, let me figure out what's causing the problem. Let me figure out how I'm feeling going through this problem and let me figure out how I want to feel. And then let me see what I need to do in order to get there. And it's hard. Don't get me wrong. It's the awareness. Most humans robots. don't have the yeah. awareness. You have to want it so badly 
in order to get it even to one of those steps, let alone all three. Just understanding that there is a problem and identifying it is a huge step. Then the system and the process, again, huge. And you can stumble on it and say why it's a stupid idea, why you're tired today, why it's not going to work today. You could be your own biggest roadblock for it to Mm -hmm. actually work. And you're going to like mess it up and say why it's not going to. And you have to want it so badly to say that even though it doesn't make sense right now, I'm going to do it because when it did make sense to me, when I was in a plan and a place of awareness of awake, I put this into plan. So now I have to just go on autopilot and I have to do it. Yeah. The doing part is a part that a lot of people like struggle with. What's the statistic? I think it's 80% or 70% of all small businesses don't make it past their second year in in business. And this is going to tie in into two places over here because most people, when you go and you start a company, anybody here that started their own company remembers the first time you went out and you told your family because whatever sales trainer you were listening to tells you, okay, you have to tell your sphere of influence. So you went and you tell your sphere of influence. And what does your sphere of influence say? They go, "Uh, are you sure? Do you 100% want to go into this? Are you sure this is the right move? And they start doubting you. And now you sit here and you're thinking to yourself, okay, crap, why did I go and tell my sphere of influence all of this, right? Like, why did I, right. why did I go and do this? And a lot of people, they, they get really off put in the beginning, uh, right. especially with what I do. I'm a real estate agent. And the first thing I do is whenever somebody comes to my office and they come and they work with us, the first thing we do is we say, okay, you're going to call your entire phone book and you're going to tell everybody that you just started a new career in real estate. And they're like, what? And we're like, yeah, because now that everybody knows one of two things are going to happen. Every time you're going to meet somebody from here on out, people are going to ask you one of two things. Hey, Joe, how's the market? First question someone's always going to ask. Or if you're going to go out and you're going to meet somebody and you're going to go out and you're going to publish something online, then people who you've spoken to in the past or or where you're connected with are going to see what you're posting. So these people, I look at them as silent accountability partners. These are people who don't know that they're holding me accountable. Very true. But these are people who are actually holding me accountable because ultimately, if you can, you're going to scroll down my wall to something I said six months ago, and then you're going to look at me now and I'm not who I am, then the, someone can turn around and someone can call bluff. The problem with our society today is that we're so soft that nobody will ever call bluff on anybody, which is an unfortunate fact. But the reality of it is that if you are a real person on your own, you're going to want to find ways to be able to hold yourself accountable. Because like you said, it, it is very hard to go out and to, and to start something and to have a system and to have a process. And it does take a very deep level of awareness, which the awareness only comes from a lot of trial and error and a lot of consistent. Consistency, and, exactly. And error. Consistency. And I was talking to a client today and they were saying, I quit after three months, every time I quit. And I say, what if you say, I'm not winning by closing a deal? It's funny, also real estate. And what if you say, my only failure is not trying. My only failure is by not doing my three phone calls a day, my 10 phone calls a day, whatever you set yourself up, that is a failure. Not closing a deal is never a failure. It's did you show up every single day what you promised yourself when you had this dream of conquering the world in real estate? Did you do the consistency part? And when you stop at three months, that was your failure, not closing a deal for three months. A hundred percent. Not only that, I'm sure as a coach, you're familiar with the 80-20 rule. Right. 20% of what you're going to reap will come from from 80%. Now, I like to turn around and I like to say, if you're already going to go hard at 80-20, why don't you just go 90-10? The concentration of taking 20% and pushing that into 10%. Even if you're going to get 1% of that 10%, it's going to be so much higher and and on such deeper of a level. If you're going to go out there and if you're going to spend three months doing something and something's not working, it means you have to increase the work and you have to increase your output. On my business, we look at two things. We look at quality and conversion rate. We're looking to be able to go and to talk to the people who actually want to talk to us, someone who's looking to buy and sell a house. But ultimately, we're also looking how many of those people that are actively looking to buy and sell a house are actually coming and working with me as their agent versus going to somebody else? The rates that we had in the beginning was one of every three. Now it's one of every two, which if you think about it, it's we, we cut out like 10%. Because you learned and you learned and you because won't be able to learn without trying a thousand times. And then you say, okay, what did I learn from this? And you know what, Joe, I say this all the time 
to people that are healing. And I say, you're going to try a million roles. You're going to read um, so many books. You're going to take online programs. You're going to listen to podcasts. And then you're going to try and you're going to try and you're going to try. And then you're going to slowly realize what fits my life, what is going to evolve with me, and what am I willing to do in order to try this long term in order to see an effect with healing. And it's with everything. It's a business, with healing, with relationship, right? It's the same thing, the consistency. And if you really want to see a long-term effect, you have to be consistent and then learn from it. It's not consistent. Oh, I failed. Oh, consistency. Where did it not work? And how can I pivot? How can I change? Or how can I implement more? If we don't do the consistency, how is it going to take place? It doesn't happen overnight. And especially with healing, people say, oh, just take medication. I'm a huge advocate for medication when it works because medication saved my life. I would be dead today without medication. But I also say, if you're giving a blind yes to medication, give a blind yes for 30 days or 40 days of twice a day doing mindfulness, doing meditation, doing gratitude. You're taking your two pills a day, guaranteed, right? For 30 days and you have a side effect and you don't even know if it's going to take place within 45 days, 60 days, 90 days. Did you do also the other things that are consistent for long term? And it could be for anything, for business, for health, for relationship, for anything that we want to change. It's the consistency. And the easiest way to stay consistent is, is to write things down. And whether it be in, in a social media way or whether it be obviously don't overshare anything that would embarrass your family or anything like that. But even on that end, trust me, you can get away with certain things if they're good goals. The things that you want to write, you want to break them down into very micro levels. Some people will turn around and say, okay, I want to make a million dollars this year, right? And okay, that's a cool idea. How many deals, how many wins, how many no's do you have to get in order to get to that? And most people will have no idea. Right. right? But if you talk to somebody who's serious about this, he'll turn around and he'll say, okay, I have to make $2,898 a day in order to make a million dollars a year. I have to make 80K a month in order to make a million dollars a year. And then you talk to somebody who's super focused, they'll be able to explain to you exactly how they're going to get there. Because then you say, okay, how do you make $2,000 a day? How do you make $14,000 a week? How do you make $28,000 a month? And they'll sit down and they'll have a system and they'll have a process for it. Not only will they have the system and the process for it, but most people, when they see that type of money in front of them, they're going to continuously work the process and then they're going to start seeing results. So it, in the beginning, when you first get started anywhere, you're not going to see results right away. The only thing that works right away is a car when you turn the engine on. That's the only thing that works right away. And even that has preliminary right. things right. that you need to check. Right. So it really, nothing is going to work on its own. You're going to, and if you want to get down to the really micro level, you have to have the engineer to go and actually build right. the car right. and then put it together. And then you have to right. make sure every nut is there. And then you have to continuously make sure that there's oil. So you have all these different things that come into it. And the best way to do that is to actually have that blueprint written down and you go, okay, for me, the best way that it works is it works as a checklist. To me, mm -hmm. it's not goals. To me, it's okay. I have to do this. I wake up in the morning, 15 minutes, I'm focusing on my life. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to brush my teeth. And then I'm going to go do this. And then I'm going to go to the gym and then I'm going to do this. And as I move along, I, I check boxes. So before I even left my house in the morning, I've already accomplished. The small wins, like Jesse Itzler says, celebrate the small wins and make the wins count. And don't take them for granted. Celebrate them. And as you said, 30%, you're already done. It couldn't be a bad day. Not, not at all. When someone calls me and asks me how, how my day is going, it's the same answer to everybody. It's just another day in paradise. And they go, what do you mean? It's raining outside. And I go, it'll be sunny soon. And then you won't remember that it's rain. In Florida summer now, people get scared. The new people right. here, they get scared. Oh my God, it's going to rain the whole day. And I go, no, nah, wait a half hour. It'll be fine. Yeah, only at four o'clock. Only at four yeah. o'clock, torrential rains by 440. It's already sunny. Yeah. It'll be done. That's it. And that's ultimately, that's your choice. Pretend you're the weatherman and right. you turn on and you decide when and what mm -hmm. and how awesome it'll be if, yeah, there's this torrential downpour, but 30 minutes later, not that you went and you had a breakdown and you lost control of everything. And 30 minutes later, you just decided, okay, whatever, I'm going to move on. Right. But you went, you sat down and you worked through however your process is. And, and then you got up and you continued moving along with your day. You pivoted, like you said, you, you learned how to take whatever is being thrown at you and you say, really? And then you go and you implement it, right? And right. you say, okay, whatever. This isn't going to work right now. No problem. If this oh, client's going to cancel on me now and they're 30 minutes late, let me open up my computer now and clear through some other tasks like that. I can bounce with it. And 
it, it takes a lot of time to get into a sink. But ultimately, when you get into a sink, then it is also very hard to get out of sync. How bad do you want it is ultimately what it boils down to. Being able to, to really visualize and understand that whatever you set your mind to is what you can actually get. And even though someone listening to this podcast today might feel like it's, it's impossible to achieve, all you got to do is go and Google my name and you'll see how I was supposed to be under a bridge somewhere at a certain point in my life, part of becoming part of a statistic that continues to be growing but I'm not part of the statistic. I'm part of a different statistic. I'm choosing and, life uh, and choosing to not be the victim. Yeah. The, of choosing to, to square up with the adversities and say, listen, not only have I squared up with them, I actually wrote a guide that's called the ultimate guide to thriving in the face of adversity. That's the whole idea of the book. There is a process to this and there's a method to overcoming all of the madness. And it, it really is just a matter of understanding it sooner because the sooner you understand it the clearer you'll be able to take aim at the things that present themselves as challenges and then be able to walk through each one so you never answered my question about what happened at 14 you were saying that it was the schools that you went to you didn't sum up the answer you started saying that it was the at 14 you attempted suicide and i wanted to understand what was going on was it that you revealed your secret and you didn't know how to deal with it? Was it that the world was not answering, was not coming towards your pain the way you expected it? Or did you just say, you know what, this life, I'm done with? Yeah, it was a big mix. The, I, I walked through the, the full story and everything that led up to it really in my book where I'm basically talking about where I was at a very low point as, as a 14-year-old. It, it, it's hard to be at a low point as a 14-year-old. Life is just starting, but I'm dealing with my dad in and out of chemo treatments, living with just everything that is going on in my head. And to answer your question without going through all of that, it was a conversation that I had with my dad. I'm not contributing my attempt of trying to take my life to any actions of my parents at all, but it was a buildup of the stress that there was at the school, being told things like this, the stress that there was in my house with my dad going in and out of everything, the stress of my dad finding out that I was going to therapy on my own and paying my way through therapy and the therapist telling him everything that I had spoken to him about. And then just the fact that I couldn't get along with people. I didn't trust anybody. I had no idea how to communicate with people at that point. I was completely shut down to where on, on my birthday, it was like, all right, why am I here? Even the next morning, no one really cared. No one came to really? me. It was a day later, day after that, that I was just in my dorm room and the principal rocked up and he was like, hey, why are you here? You don't belong here. And I was like, yeah, no. And he screamed at me. And then I ended up just going back to school. When I was 14, I was in a really shitty place. You were just basically saying, I don't have a safe place. I feel like not at home, not in school, not even in your therapist's office, which is supposed to hold your pain. Yeah, it's very important to note that it's not well, my house was a place that I didn't feel comfortable in, but it was more of the fact that there was so much chaos that was going on. Yeah. And it was just like, I, I wasn't sure what or how. And then when you're dealing with all of that, it's very and there's important such to confusion. Be able to have a, a, yeah, it's when you're confused it's important to be able to go and get deconfused as fast as possible. Right. And the more confused you get, then what reality are you living? You're living the reality of the past confusion. And mm -hmm. then when you get even more confused, you're dealing with that confusion again. And then just that's where the spiral out of control thing comes up. You really just don't have anything to nail it down. Now, as a 14 year old, you're not supposed to have this level of self-awareness that you're having an issue. It, you're, it's not necessary for a normal person. It's not at all. And to us, people who have been through so much already in our lives and have learned to overcome a lot of things, you look back and you're like, okay, why? And then there's questions and there's more questions and there's questions from every angle. But at the same time, even to myself in therapy, there were a lot of times that my therapist had to remind me, hey, dude, take a deep breath like you were 14. And when I realized that, it gave me an ability to really say, okay, well, I'm not going to make the same mistakes I did when I was 14, when I was 15, when I was 16, when I was 17, when I was 18. And, and so on and learning from those past mistakes and then plugging into other people who ultimately, as you move along in your life, you learn what you want to be like. And then you usually find one or two people who were successful to a certain extent with certain ideologies that you have that you try and take some things that they've done and you use them in your own life. That's the successful way to do things.
to go and learn from other people's mistakes for free and then go and try and implement them in your life. And you're going to mess up because these aren't your thing. These are other people's things. You need to figure out how to make them work for you. Someone called me the other day and they were bugging out because they felt that someone stole their copy. That's a very big thing that people do in social media these days. They call it stealing like an artist. They take something that you invested your heart and your soul into and they change a couple sentences and then it becomes their content. And I told this guy, I was like, bro, you think five years in the game, this has never happened to me. I've written some really good stuff. I've ghostwritten a lot. I've took, taken a lot of copywriting courses and a lot of my material has been made its way to a lot of these big influencers, ad copy and marketing. And you know what I tell them? I say, listen, there's a reason why they're copying you because what good. you're doing is really good. But here's the best part. The best part is that they're copying you, which means that you're the one who's in control of the next step. So even though they're copying you right now and what they're doing right now might be working, well, duh, it's your genius. Obviously it's working, but they're not in control of what you're going to do next. How they're are you going to react? Copy. Not even reaction. So Don't what? even think about it as a reaction because human beings in today's day and age, we're so used to reacting to things. Right, we're under right. so much stress right. that we're used to reacting to things. Don't look at it like this is your plan, right? When a business starts, what do you do? You go and you take headshots. Then you go and you write copy. Then you go and you write a blog. Then you go and start a podcast. Then you go and start a social media page. There's steps to doing these things. It's a checklist. Again, right? Taking out all of that anxiety and that fear and that stress that we have. Okay. So when someone goes and takes your content and copies you, they don't know what your next step is. They don't know the next thing you want to do. Because when you're publishing what you're publishing, you have a bigger idea as to what the, what so this post saying it's a piece of a bring. big puzzle and they exactly. just got out of a 500 piece puzzle they got one piece so what are they doing with on that piece nothing Not they don't have the piece. full picture they don't have the 499 other pieces so what's that going to be in the big picture just exactly. one piece and not only that, the piece that they have is so in insignificant. It's just like the blank color pieces that they have for filler. Right. And when you look at it like that, then it's not, oh my gosh, I'm under attack. It's, hey, this is social proof that I'm really good because people mm -hmm. are stealing my stuff. So now that people are taking my stuff, it means you're really good. It yeah. just means that now you have to get a little better to protect yourself. But ultimately, that is the biggest flattery. Right. And then when you go and you continue doing that, then okay. The fact that someone stole content of mine three years ago isn't something that bothers me right now because right, right now that person has me blocked on Facebook. So I don't even care anymore right. because all these things just become insignificant. And then 100%. you just continue moving along because right. when you're running with your own energy, energy and <laughs> funny how it's at the same time, with your own energy, with your own motivation, then it, it's really hard to stop. Not only that, like I, I often say to people, stop caring what other people say. When you're laser focused on your mission, when you're so focused, these things just make you laugh. Like when someone steals it, you laugh because you know that you're the only you in the world. As you said, they can't copy you. They can copy your copy, but they can't copy you. You're the unique you with your mission and your drive. Your drive and their drive is different. So you're going to end up in a different place when you zone out and you're like, I don't care. It's the biggest freedom. And you're like, fine. Not only that, but some people like, yeah, I, lo I love how you brought it up. But some people are worried about their reputation and some people are worried about what other people will say about them. And then you have the people who are worried about what other people will say about you. And most of the time, who are very nervous when someone's going to go out and going to start something new. And the best answer to something like that is, what do you mean? You're worried about my reputation. I am creating my reputation. Think about it. We were born into an environment that we had no control over. And up until you go and you decide that you're going to change that environment, you're literally just continuing to perpetuate the environment, right? There's no sense of individuality. But now that you're going to go out and you're going to do something, obviously people are going to say, hey, no, don't do it because people don't want you to leave them. They want everybody to stay on the bottom. And everybody, hey, we sit, we complain. We do things differently around here. But the second that you're going to go and you're going to lift yourself up and you're going to get out of that, then obviously people are going to have what to say. And 98% of the time, it's not going to be good because they want you to stop because most of the time they feel threatened by it. Why would you let somebody who is just trying to bring you down? My favorite way of looking at things and the perspective that really was able to help me get out of all of that, because you know I was so spiteful that I would do things in order to show people that I can and then I realized ultimately it was just costing me a lot of money that I could be investing into myself. Mm -hmm. And the best way to really look at that was like, hey, look, if you don't pay my bills, you don't make me happy, and you don't really have anything to do with me, then it doesn't really 
matter. The opinion doesn't matter. If I wouldn't be running to you for advice, if I needed help, then your opinion doesn't matter when I don't. Like it's a way of looking at it to where the only people who I really need to make happy are frankly, not that many. So long as you have that figured out and you realize that, and then you realize that, okay, look, you know what, whatever I can do me. And after two, three weeks, these people will go away. And then ultimately the people who turn around and they go, they laugh at you for not seeing you at the club or not seeing you at these different events and things. You laugh at them and you say, Hey, I haven't seen you at the bank in a while. And that's the best way to do it. Because ultimately who's, who really has the last laugh? But it's hard sometimes. I'm going to tell you that it took me a year until my real crash 11 years ago. I was living in La La Land, pleasing the world and making sure that I'm showing up for everyone. And uh, my name is Matana, which is gift. So I was the gift to the world. So I couldn't say no to anyone. When I learned that when I was saying yes to everybody, I was saying no to myself. I was just digging myself deeper and deeper, deeper into my own pit of misery. I'm so grateful for my rock bottom because it taught me to be okay with the comfort zone that was so uncomfortable to let it go and to say, you know what, these people that I thought were okay for me are really not okay for me. And the only person I need to care about is myself because now I have children and I owe it to them to be okay. So Yes, yeah, sometimes it's people that you think you will never be able to exist without them. And that's the hard part. Think about family and community. In the Orthodox community, so many can say, if you're going to do X, we won't accept you anywhere anymore in this community. And you have to choose. Are you choosing you or are you choosing community? And it's so hard. And what if it's somebody you love dearly your whole life or you were taught to love dearly? Oh, you were taught that you love them dearly. You were taught to love them dearly. Exactly. So at what point do we wake up and say, you know what? We need to choose and go inward and choose our boundaries and choose what's good for us and ask ourselves, who am I serving when I'm doing this? Do you sometimes feel stuck? Do you wish you can be somewhere else? Do you have a vision of where you want to get to, but you just don't know what the first step to take in order to get to that life that you're dreaming of? Many people ask me, what did I do in order to create this wellness that I'm living in? How did I shift from deep depression, from extreme anxiety to a thriving life, to a productive life, to a life full of joy? I put many things into practice and it's every single day. Many of you know that it's gratitude, a healthy mindset boundaries, self-love, and one of the most important things that many people don't speak about, forgiveness, self-forgiveness and forgiveness to others, essential for healing. If you want to work one-on-one with me in order to move forward towards that dream life that you have a vision of, click the link below in the show notes. It's a custom-made program for you, one-on-one with me. We will develop a concrete program that you can implement in your life so you can create a better well-being. Click the link below. Looking forward to working with you. And now enjoy the rest of the episode. Who am I serving when I'm doing this? Yeah, take the service out of it for a second because people get confused when uh, sometimes when you put that in there because a lot of people were brought up, people that were trauma, they were brought up with going to services, going to certain things that were like requirements and take that out a second and, and, and just look at the perspective of who is benefiting from this that I'm doing right now. The fact that I'm stressing out because I have a, an image to maintain. Right. And if I don't keep that image and people look at me differently, who is the one who's ultimately benefiting from somebody like that? The answer is nobody. So the trick is to find things that you benefit from just because you're benefiting from something doesn't mean it's a trade-off. It's not a trade-off that, oh, I'm going to benefit from this. Oh, this needs to happen. You can do things ultimately for what makes you happy because at the end of the day, just because somebody isn't happy with something that you're doing doesn't change the fact that whatever you're doing is still a good thing. Or it doesn't change the fact that whatever you're doing is good for your overall mental health. Right. It's okay for people not to be okay with the things that you're doing because little well-known fact People will never be okay with what you're doing if it involves self-improvement because you may now become better than them. And I'm not going to say that this is the perspective of most people because you will meet in your journey a lot of amazing people who will really only just be there to support you. 
But anybody who's going to give you a problem with what you do and not support you, 90% of the time, it's because these people are fearful. They are fearful for what you may actually accomplish. We were trained so well growing up to do something specific and only do something specific and not deviate from doing something specific. The second that you're going to turn around and say, hey, listen, I'm not challenging this, but I want to go do something else. There's threats. There's more threats. And then there's punishments. And then there's consequences. And, and fear there's... factors. Yeah. Listen, how many people listening to this podcast that grew up religious can relate to something along the lines of parents being stressed out about how one of your siblings are acting because of what's going to happen to your sister or what's the name of your family going to be? This whole thing was ultimately just as big. Cons if there's a one real conspiracy theory that we can talk about that hasn't already been debunked, it's this conspiracy theory of the fact that parents have this idea in their head that how all of their kids act is going to really reflect on their image as parents. Because that is like the one thing that I think at this point in today's day and age, this can be the thing that we turn around and say, listen, parents, we appreciate everything you've done. And we understand that what your children do, you cannot necessarily control. Think about it like this. You're flying on an airplane and a baby starts crying at two o'clock in the morning. What, are you going to start beating up the parent? No, you're going to try and help the baby, right? Because it's not the parent's fault that something out of their control is happening. And I think when parents first see that perspective, uh, I have parents call me, it was really funny when I first left the fold, a lot of people would call me with their at-risk kids and they wanted advice and they wanted help. How's it working for me? My first thing was like, hello, dude, just take a deep breath, accept them. Just tell them that whatever they do, you will support them. And, and they'll start trusting you. It's that simple. We're looking as people, we're looking for people to support us. But at the same time, you need to think to yourself, am I pandering to this person to support me? Or is this person genuinely supporting me because they want to see me succeed? Exactly. Now, a lot of people are going to say, oh, I want only the best. And I know that this is wrong. Do you ever know that this is wrong? Really? Do you really know? Did you try it and fail it? That it's wrong? Like that you're so convinced that Oh, I'm doing it for the better good because I know that it's not going to work out. How do you know? How do you know? Well, I always ask the people who say things like that. I say, great, can I borrow the crystal ball? Because I need it for a couple other things in my life. Normally those people are like, oh, and I'm like, no, listen, you brought this up. Let's have it out. And, and that's really the thing. It's as you move along, the first couple of times you get challenged or someone says something, it's not necessarily like you will be able to have all of the tools that you need to overcome these things. This is people have accountability partners because in the beginning it, it is very hard and it's very easy to get off of it right away and discourage yourself to continue just doing what you're doing because that's what you're used to. But breaking these habits and, and challenging yourself in a healthy way to grow and to become better is something that can really be broken down to a process that can be very easy to follow so long as you're consistent with it. And that's really the common theme riding along through this entire podcast and through most of my journey, which is, listen, you can think about whatever you want. You can visualize whatever you want. You can vision board whatever you want. But ultimately, until you pick up the phone in my industry, until you pick up the phone and start dialing, you don't really open up any sort of opportunity. Right. And to some people, it can mean until you mail out those letters. To other people, it can mean until you post those ads. To other people, it can mean until you have the conversation with the person that you've been avoiding having the conversation with, right. it, whichever way it looks at it. And that's really how you can be in control over where the growth goes, because leaning into the adversity as it comes up, instead of shying away from it and taking that adversity and breaking it down to a very core level and realizing that adversity is energy coming at you and energy if you shock it in a certain way, you can change the wavelength. So I don't have a high school diploma, but I figured this out. Wow. If you can shock the wavelength into working on your frequency, then whoever touches that wire better be very careful because they'll get electrocuted. So all you got to do now is find the next wire that you're going to tie into to create mm -hmm. your own ecosystem. Who were your mentors? Nobody that I'm proud. Really? To, to, to say. No one helped you get here? You can't say, I have this mentor, this book, this course, like nothing. So I've read to date, I've read over 200 self-help books. So which one was the most powerful for you? Okay. Two, I'll give you two. The subtle art of not giving a fuck 
is one of my favorite books by Mark Manson. And then the book that really taught me the basic communication skills that I needed to start learning would be How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Okay. That- I've been through almost the entire Carnegie line of programs and books and audiobooks, all of Mark Manson's stuff. These two people are really people that have taught me a lot in the beginning. And then Simon Snack and like people who, who really are successful in what I wanted to become. Right. Stoic to adversities clean, systematic to when it comes to dealing with problems, having a a can-do attitude and being approachable, ultimately. These were the first like real things that I subscribed to. Alex Sharfin is somebody who I I had as a coach for a while. Grant Cardone is somebody who I've been through all of his marketing stuff. I've been through a lot of coaches and a lot of programs and every program at a certain point had that gray area where people were trying to figure it out. And because of where I was like, Hey, no, this is against what I stand for. And it's not always that I line up with these coaches, but as a general rule of thumb, 10% of my income goes towards self-development programs, masterminds, meetup events. I'm flying to four different States over the next three months to go to these different events, different meetups happening in Florida, connecting with people right now. My mentors are the people that I work with every day and are the, the relationships that I create on a daily basis. On an average day, I talk to at least 75 people over the phone. I have a day, been, 75 a day, a day, a day. I'm 75 up every morning. Five a day. And then I have wait, your brain off. doesn't melt. So I again going on the processes and systems. 75 a day. If I spoke to seven people a day, I would be in trouble. To me, it's this is a completely another topic. I've met over a million people face to face in the last five years. And what I've learned to do is I learned to communicate with people in a very easy, simple way. I've broken down what I do today to a process. My, my maximum time on a call would be between seven and 10 minutes. And then I have a whole team that takes the people that I speak to, we filter them out and then we choose each one. Exactly. My sales team is a three level sales team and I'm the opener. There's a buffer in the middle, and then I ultimately close afterwards at the end. But what about people you love, like people you care about? I hope they don't go through that system. No, the people that I love and care about know that they call me. If they can't get in touch with me, they leave me a voice message. Because again, going through the process over the last six years, there were times that I didn't return phone calls. There were times I didn't talk to people. And people don't like that, by the way. And then you have to tell yourself, I'm choosing me. I know it's a choice. Whatever I say no to, I'm saying yes to something else. It doesn't feel good. My sister that I'm very close to, we're a year and 10 10 months apart. My whole family lives in Israel. I'm the only one that lives in America. And she left me this voice note. She's like, Matana, are you aware that you haven't reached out in six months? And I'm like, really? I didn't? So no, you didn't. I'm like, I guess I just couldn't. And I was reflecting back and I said, you know what? My days are very busy. My old self would probably prioritize everyone else but myself. And I said, listen, I'm prioritizing things that are really important to me. And I know that I'm saying no to a lot of things that I used to say yes to. But if I say yes to everything else, where am I going to end up? Yeah, I had a similar conversation a couple of years ago with some other people in my family. And it's these people they feel is okay, we're related, you should be calling me. And uh, my answer to that was, hey, if we're related, and I should be calling you, then if you haven't heard from me in six months, why haven't you picked the phone call me? No, my sister reached out a bunch of times. I had mm-hmm. to choose. I, I, I missed out birthday parties and the celebrations because I chose yes to one thing. And of course, you have to put in husband, children, because they are your priority. For me, it is. Mm-hmm. For my, it's mm-hmm. my number one. And then my parents, they're the number two. And then, and I'm always in the middle. So yes, we end up saying no to a lot. And that's okay. And that's okay. A hundred percent. What it boils down to is when friends and family reach out, I'm really good with communication, right? I obviously, I I try and respond and talk to these people right away, but ultimately if it takes a day or two for me to get back, I used to apologize and I used to say, Hey, listen, I'm sorry. I haven't called you back. And now it's, Hey, listen, thank you for being patient until I was able to return your call. I love that. I want to start using that. If you rip two apologies with two thank yous every single day, your life will just be a easier, calmer life. If you replace two apologies with two thank yous, so instead of apologizing, you're going to somebody, say two thank yous. You're going to say thank you. At thank the same you. thing. Like instead of saying, I'm sorry, I didn't call you back. 
Thank you for waiting. Thank you for being. Thank you for your patience. That's it. Reaching out. Move on. Yeah. Thank you for your patience. I was able to get on the phone with you now. What's up? All right. Oh, thank you for being able to work with me on rescheduling this, or thank you for this. Instead of apologizing, and it doesn't have to be, obviously that's within context, right? Don't sound like an idiot. Thank you. If, if you need to apologize. Thank you for hitting my car. That doesn't make sense. No, but you're saying if you really screwed up, you, you apologize, of course. Don't be a jerk and an idiot, of course. Yes. But don't say uh, automatically be the, oh no, I screwed up. Um, Cause maybe you know you how didn't. people are always apologizing. Yeah. People are always apologizing for things. And the best way to answer something like that is like, you have nothing to apologize for. Because what does that do? It starts reinforcing, okay, wow, wow, there actually is nothing to apologize for. Right, right. It's the same mentality where when you start creating thank yous in your life, yeah. you're going to have more thank yous in your life. Yeah. It's just, it's a perspective. Oh, I love show. that. I can't believe with all the mindset books and, and things that I went through, I never heard that. Who taught you that? Was there a specific uh, book you read that in? This isn't from a book. It's definitely a mindset shift. Is this your own invention? Yeah. This is my approach to life. No, because I'm big on mindset. I'm huge on mindset. What you're going to, where you're going to focus your energy is where you're going to end up. So if you're focusing on cues, that's what you're going to attract more thank yous. If you're focusing on, I'm sorry, you're going to attract more disappointments and screw ups and whatever. I so love that. Wow. That's my big takeaway from today. We heard your adversity, huge adversity, so much pain. At what point did you say, I'm owning my adversity? I'm no longer going to be a victim to it. I'm choosing life versus pain. I'm choosing life on a high vibration, life with reading Dale Carnegie, like life of abundance. You wouldn't go to all these courses. And Grant Cardone does not talk about anything but abundance and opportunity. So at what point did you say, I'm no longer a victim. I'm choosing my own life. I don't think there was one specific time that I realized, okay, I am no longer going to be a victim and I'm going to start winning. And you watch these TED Talks where these people say that and it sounds oh so uplifting. And then you go and you try it and you're like, okay, crap. Nothing changed. I'm still here. My life still sucks. What's going on? It's a progressive appreciation and realization of the trial and error of really going out there and trying and then failing and then realizing, okay, what if I did it like this? Would I have failed? And the possibility of not failing, right, is the excitement that would lead you to actually going and trying that theory. In my case. So for me, I go, okay, listen, if this isn't going to work, then there's got to be something that works. So I need to figure out what that is. And to some people, after the first time, they go, okay, it's not going to work. Forget it. It's not going to work. There's no chance. It's not happening. You know what? I tried. That's it, guys. I'm done. And then you have the people who they sit down once and they try and they sit down again and they try. They sit down again and they try. Anybody who, who knows somebody who, who does CrossFit, they know that the inside of their hands are completely shaved out, completely done, hard, really. And the reason for that is because that's how their hands adapted. Everybody started off with soft hands, right? And then what do they start doing? They start lifting weights. The metal rubs against your hands and the first couple of times it cracks your skin. Most people at that point give up and they never do it again. And then it heals itself and they have soft hands again. But the people who continue working and continue working hard, those people, their hands get harder and they get harder. And then there's another layer and then there's another layer and then there's another layer. And certain things that for these people, they don't need gloves. The regular average person does. And you just get stronger and stronger, whatever you're continuously training at. The more repetition, again, it's the same common themes that in every angle, that it's not like this event. Because then when I was 18 and when I was 19, when I was 21, when I was 22, when I was even 23, like more adversities came up. You're never going to finish up with all the adversities and then have smooth sailing. It's not going to happen. That is La La Land. But at the same time, you can create your own little version of La La Land and live that in day-to-day -day life. So even though Everything. Now, this is not the, the well-known famous picture of the whole house burning and the people sitting at the kitchen saying, oh, it's okay. That's not what this is. This is understanding that if the whole house is burning, you got to get out and put the fire out. 
and having a process for that. And then if you understand that if a fire is burning, you got to go put it out and here's the water, here's this, then you put it out, then you realize, okay, you know what? This is where fire safety prevention comes in. Learning. What I learned from my life is that you get to a point that you no longer fear the adversity. You're like, okay, I'm strong enough to deal with the pain and the adversity. I'll figure it out. Cause I, as Jesse Hitler said, says, I didn't come this far to only come this. And I'm going to have bigger challenges and I'm going to have things that I'm going to have fires that I'll have to put out, but I got this. I did so much already that I'm going to figure it out. And I have no idea what life is going to bring. No idea. I just know that I know how to, as you say, put the system into place, change the system around and, and tweak it. Forget the whole system, forget the system, build a new mainframe, put the yeah. system on your yeah. back and carry it. Yeah. And do it on your own. And being able to understand that at the beginning, it's going to be very hard, but taking pleasure through that process is ultimately, you'll be able to end up to where you're matana, living a life that's full of a gift. And I'm me, living my life, that every morning I wake up and it's just another day in paradise. My MO is gratitude, living with gratefulness and gratitude. And I always say to people, don't think I'm doing this because I'm holy. I am not doing it because I'm this incredible human connected to God. Yes, I can, I'm connected to God, but I'm doing it because it serves me. And when you realize that it serves you, why would you not tap into it? So you put things into place because it serves you. And then you figure it out and you're like, wow, okay, this is great. Let's continue. Let's up the dose. When you have a headache and two Tylenols are not helping, up the dose maybe to three. With depression, if certain dose doesn't work, you up the dose. I say with gratitude, up the dose. With mindset, up the dose. With boundaries, up the dose. With forgiveness, up the dose. And then certain things just magic. I, everybody's, oh, it's magic. No, it's not magic. The system that I put into my place works perfectly. And then if there's cracks and then I know how to heal it and then move forward. Do you think that the IDF did a lot in your strength and your core to believe in yourself and to really say, wow, I do hard stuff and I survive? I think the IDF it definitely gave me a lot of that confidence in my physical aspect. I was definitely very headstrong before, before I got there. Just getting into the army is a process in and of itself. And then they try to deny me. And then I had to go fight for it. And then, oh, it's long story. But even within that, like I felt that was a test of did I really want it? No normal 21 year old who is already on his way to success goes and stops everything they're doing to go to the army. But it was something to me, I felt like if I can do this, that I am truly unstoppable. That was really the way that I approached it. And every day that I was in the army, I had an American officer who would drive me up the walls. But ultimately, I continued pushing back and continued doing it and continued until ultimately I, I finished. And it was one of those experiences that really taught me. I lost 80 pounds in the army. Like those, every one of those pounds was another insecurity that I had and another thing that I wasn't sure how to deal with, it definitely gave me a lot of clarity, 100%. It's not something that I would necessarily recommend for everybody, but for me, it was exactly what I needed. And then straight off of that, it gave me the opportunity to, COVID had hit. I finished the Army in February of 2020. And uh, oh by March my already. Oh my goodness. Of, by, a uh, month by, before COVID. Were you in Israel when it started? No. The last place I visited was London, England. I took the last flight from London into America. I finished the army and was supposed to go on a 20-day trip where every day and a half I'd be visiting another country in Europe. While I was in the army and during the time I had off, I went out you know, to different countries around Israel and I just wanted to finish up that rest of that side of Europe before I came back to America. And then midway through the trip, here we are talking about adversities, right? I get this at the place that I was staying at, family friend, he goes, listen, I, I think it might actually be time to head home. And I was like, wait, what? And he goes, no, we're not kicking you out or anything, but there's talk of closing a border down and whatever. You know, that's when I, that's when I got out right around that time, I sold off my home security company, which it's a whole crazy story, how I got into that industry, but I sold off the company right before then. And where 60% of the business that we did was knocking door to door. Oh my God, so, you would not be able to do it. You would, you would go dry as soon as COVID hit. Yeah, we were able to take, so the business as itself was 
completely automated and up and running without the door knocking people like that really didn't, it didn't play much into it, but it was the fact that I was able to get out of that right before that, and then get into a place where people needed me here on the ground. So that was awesome. So you but came yeah, back to, New to Miami. I came back to New York and then from New York, I spent time in California, how like I had everything in mind, but as things developed, moving from all of those stages of long distance relationship and getting to know all of that, then yeah, ultimately that's what it turned into. Yeah. Wow. What a story. So we're going to put the link to your book. Is it on Amazon? It's on Amazon and it's on my website. What's your website? Fixingbrokenthebook.com. I have a last question that I ask everyone. What does hope mean to you? Oh, that's a deep question. Hope to me means the possibility of a better today. Wow. Can I just tell you how that's so deep? Because a lot of people say that tomorrow will be better. You don't even get to tomorrow. You're like, why wait till tomorrow? Today. Yeah. Hope is the possibility of a better today. Wow. I like that. Thank you very much. What's your goal for 2021? My goal is to meet and greet at least another two and a half thousand people. Meet and greet. So there's no closing goal. Your goal is not financial for this year. Oh, obviously we have our goals and we have our stretch goals and we have things like that. Thank God we're on pace to be able to, to get to all of that. The way I look at it is that wherever I achieve, I always have another stretch. It's never really like a specific number or a specific amount of transactions or a okay. specific amount of clients. Okay. To me, the day that it becomes about a number or it becomes about a transaction, it becomes about a client. That's the day that I know I have to change it because it's never about that. It's about the relationship. It's about the value that we bring. And it's really how we can help other people and how we can show up for people in ways that they cannot show up for themselves. That's really what it is. But being able to be an educated, knowledgeable, experienced professional in, in the real estate industry is something that I really pride myself in. And it's not something that I need to associate it with something like a number or an amount of closings or an amount of deals. Because if you share, I have a YouTube channel, I have a, a first time home buyer's book, I have a seller's book, and I have the courses that I do every single Thursday in my office. So between all of that, all I'm doing here is really just putting out things that can educate people where I'm not asking people for their business. I'm just saying, hey, listen, if you want education, get the right education. 90% of the time, those people who get that education, they now have questions where they're going to go. They're going to come back to me. Right. Because that's sure. where right. their information came from. Right. So right. again, being out there to share and be there as a benefit for people. Give value. Always, Give value. Always return. Nice. Very nice. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you, everybody, for joining me here. And go check Joe out. On, all, on his platforms, follow him. He will inspire you. And maybe you will even look into real estate through him. You never know. You can find me easily on Facebook. Just literally just Google my name um, and I'll come up. You'll be able to find all of my links to the first page of Google. You'll find my YouTube channel. You'll find my Facebook page. And then you can also find my book website, Fixing Broken the Book, uh, com, And then you can just look it up on Amazon. It's over there. We just got notification earlier this week from Amazon that we're very close to hitting number one bestseller status. So if you can get on there and leave me a review, that would be awesome. Yes, do that. Thank you again. Have a good night. Thank you for listening till the end. We highly appreciate all of our listeners. And Mental Health Together is better. You being here means a tremendous amount to us. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like some extra boost of information and inspiration that is not on the podcast, you can go to our website, hopetorecharge.com. There's some premium content that for the cost of a cup of coffee, you can download some amazing information that will help you, a tool that will guide you through life. So don't skip a beat. Don't hesitate. Go to hopetorecharge.com and see what other offerings we have there for your mental health well-being. Thank you for joining us. And remember, if you enjoyed this and you want to say thank you, the best way of gratitude will be by you leaving a review or a comment or sharing this with a loved one. There is no greater form of gratitude for us. Thank you. Bye till next time.
This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com, the leading online platform for therapy. You can access thousands of therapists one click away. Go check out BetterHelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Get 10% off your first month. Start your wellness now.